Okay, now we're, we're going to have a, a more detailed discussion of Gustavus Vasa uh, because it's the reading for this week, including my article on Gustavus Vasa, Wallata Equiano, What's in a Name, the actual text of the interesting narrative, uh, and then we, we've got a video uh, by that features a number of the major authorities on the life of this man uh, with whom I'm in considerable disagreement on a number of very, very important points. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this uh, the slide presentation is to examine some of those points. Here's our man. Um, one point to note here is that I think he was born in 1742. Uh, he says in his autobiography he was born in 1745. Uh, those three years may not sound like much, but when we're trying to remember what a child remembers, three years is a big difference. The same map as I showed you before, which shows his extensive travels, not only from the Bight of Biafra, first to Barbados, then to Virginia, and then to England, but his uh, travels during the Seven Years' War, his uh, travels to the Arctic on a scientific mission, and his involvement in Caribbean trade while he was still a slave and then when he was subsequently a free person. He went to 14 different uh, Caribbean islands. Here is a chronology of his uh, life, uh, which shows uh, most of the key points. Uh, his, he was first a slave to a Mr. Campbell, who was to, tobacco uh, owned a tobacco plantation in Virginia, then to a, a, a British uh, sea captain and naval uh, commander, uh, Pascal, uh, when he was baptized in London. Uh, his, uh, his enslavement to a merchant in the Caribbean who lived in Montserrat, Robert King, uh, and other details of his uh, life, uh, including his increasing involvement in the abolitionist um, uh, movement, including uh, the making the, the notorious Zong affair known to the public. The Zong was a slave ship where uh, the captain, a man by the name of Collingwood, uh, deliberately murdered 132 slaves so that he could collect insurance uh, money on the, those slaves. His marriage to Susanna Cullen, uh, a Scottish woman, and his death in 1797 and his final, the abolition of the British slave trade a decade after his death. Here showing his homeland of Ebo land uh, that I've shown you before. Here an important detail in his autobiography because he describes in great detail the Ichi facial markings, which he was destined to get, uh, but not for another year or so, so he never actually had them. And the reason that they were given was it was a sign of um, freedom and it was a sign of uh, elite status within an Igbo society. Um, and it was um, an indication that and anybody with these types of markings should not have been enslaved. Uh, if they were enslaved, they had a tendency to commit suicide, which meant that the Igbo in general had a reputation in the Americas for a tendency towards suicide. He received his slave name, Gustavus Vasa, uh, when he was bought by Captain Pasco, uh, who for some reason named him after the King of Sweden, who was the liberator of the Swedish people from Danish rule. And, <clears throat> and Gustavus Vasa, obviously not a common name in England, because it's not an English name. Um, but it was a name that was known at the time in England, uh, 
as a symbol of resistance to tyranny and why his master should have named him this uh, is not clear. It's probably a joke. Masters named slaves all kinds of things. But our hero uh, appreciated the name because he also thought that he was predestined to be the leader of his people and to lead them out of slavery in the same way that Gustavus Vasa had, had, had freed the Swedish people from the tyranny of Danish rule. Here are documents that show that he always signed himself Gustavus Vasa and never a Wallata Equiano. Uh, th these are his, his will from 1797, the year that he died. <clears throat> this is a reverse of a letter that where somebody wrote uh, a comment on the back of a letter that Vasa had written to the very famous abolitionist Granville Sharp in 1780. Uh, the comment was written some years later, but it said very clearly that our man, Gustavus Vasa, actually was got very angry any time someone called him by his birth name, Wallata Equiano, which is really interesting because modern scholarship has decided they're going to call him Wallata Equiano, even though this is not the name that he wanted to be called, and it's not the name that he was known during his lifetime. So why would modern scholarship decide to adopt a, a name for this person uh, that was not the, the chosen name of the individual himself is a very important question. And you will see in the video that we watch that uh, he's referred to repeatedly as Equiano, as if Equiano was his surname, his last name, and it was not a surname. Uh, Equiano was part of his birth name, Wallata Equiano, which was one name. It was not like a first name and a surname. During the Seven Years' War, he was um, quite fortunate <clears throat> in one sense in that the ships that he served on under Captain Pasco as Pasco's personal servant, as his slave, um, had schools on board the ships for young, for boys. There were on all of these ships, there were boys, uh, not just the, and, the, and the boys had schools that they went to when there was no action and they were just uh, sitting around in port or they were out at sea doing nothing but sailing around. They went to school and our, and our man, Gustavus Vasa, uh, was lucky to uh, to get quite an advanced education on board ship. Uh, he was uh, uh, at the Battle of, of Lewisburg uh, when Britain um, defeated the French Navy off the coast of, of Canada and uh, <clears throat> he was on the same ship as General Wolfe um, who died in, at Quebec City when the city was taken from the French. In 1759, uh, Vasa was baptized. <clears throat> he was baptized in St. Margaret's Church, uh, which, for those of you who know London, is right next to Westminster Abbey, which you just see a, a, a small bit of it on the upper right-hand corner of this uh, photo. Uh, of Westminster Abbey and St. Margaret's Church are immediately across the street. Just behind them is the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. Uh, and, that's a, and so he was really baptized in the seat of power in, in, in London. He was not the only African or black person to be baptized in this church, but it was one of the few by far. This is the baptismal record that you'll see also in the video, uh, which shows his name, Gustavus Vasa, black born in Carolina, 12 years old. Well, his name was Gustavus Vasa. He was an African, not just a black, but he was not born in Carolina. He was born where he said he was born, uh, in the interior of the Bight of Biafra, uh, 
and in, 18, in 1759 he was not 12 years old. He was much closer uh, to being um, uh, 17 or even 18 years old. But this is one of the documents that Vincent Coretta and other scholars who are in the video have claimed uh, proves that uh, Vasa did not tell the truth about where he was born. Uh, in short, that he was not born in Africa, therefore he did not experience the middle passage crossing the Atlanta, and therefore um, this is a serious uh, charge of, um, of lying uh, against uh, uh, somebody who has become recognized as an extremely important intellectual among Africans in the late 18th century, except that he wasn't lying because he didn't write this in the book. Uh, this was written by, um, uh, dictated by his godparents who were the cousins of his master uh, and therefore were um, um, this, to accept their word as slave owners uh, is, um, has some, raises some questions in itself. Why should we believe what they said about this man? especially since from other information we know very well that they they know that Gustavus Vasa came from Virginia not from Carolina and that they know that he came from Africa before that uh, but nonetheless this is one of the documents that's been used to attempt to discredit Gustavus Vasa's uh, truthfulness a second document that is used uh, by Coretta relates to an, a scientific expedition that Vasa was on in 1773 under the command of uh, Constantine Phipps, uh, later known as Lord Mulgrave. Uh, Constantine Phipps was on a purely scientific expedition to the Arctic in 1773. He went with two ships. Uh, to the Arctic. Uh, his, uh, his aim was to try to show that it was possible to sail uh, to the Pacific, not on the Northwest uh, Passage north of Canada, but on the Northeast Passage uh, across uh, north of Siberia. And it was an attempt to prove that you could sail from England uh, north of Siberia and get all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Well, what they successfully proved is that you couldn't do it, that the, our, the ice in this area never melts, and so therefore there is no such passage across that way. And in, in, on that expedition, the whole of the two ships almost died because they got stuck in the ice and had great difficulty uh, breaking free. Uh, this is a picture of them moving the two ships, uh, pulling them through the ice. Uh, that is from the records of that expedition. And Gustavus Vasa was on this expedition as the assistant to the lead scientist on the expedition, a man by the name of Charles Irving. Uh, and um, uh, that's why he was there. And in doing so, in, on the, the ship, the Racehorse, which was one of the two ships, uh, he is registered there. I, apparently, he's registered there because there's someone registered as Gustavus Weston, not Vasa, but Weston. And it's been alleged by the people who want to believe in the baptismal record that this also is another example that proves uh, that he was born in South Carolina, not in Africa, and that this Gustavus Veston is the same as Gustavus Vasa, and just that the guy who wrote down the name Veston uh, didn't, hadn't, didn't know the name Vasa, which is not an English name, and this was his best effort at doing so. However, there's a really serious problem with accepting this as a second document for two reasons. One, 
Gustavus Vestum may not be Gustavus Vasa, in which case there's no Gustavus Vasa in the whole list of people on board those ships, which is possible because he was not on the ship as a seaman. He was on the ship as the personal assistant to the lead scientists, and that was quite something quite different. Uh, but more important, even, even if uh, this Gustavus Veston is our Gustavus Vasa, and it says South Carolina, this is not really an independent document. Let me explain what I mean. The baptismal record says Gustavus Vasa born in Carolina. There's no question about that. We don't know why it says that. Uh, we know that he didn't write it, so that it's questionable that he can be held responsible for the what's said there. Um, but nonetheless, it exists. But by the time he's on the expedition to the Arctic, he's a free man. He's a free African. Uh, he's he has to uh, at the time if you were black. You had to carry papers with you all the time that proved that you were free and that you were not a slave. Well, he had, he had two documents that proved who he was and proved that he was a free person. One document was his baptismal record, which said that he was born in Carolina. His second document uh, was his emancipation papers, which he reproduces in his autobiography, uh, which states when and where and who gave him his freedom. And that was somebody by the name of Robert King who gave him his freedom in the Caribbean um, a couple of years earlier. So his two documents are one, a baptismal record that wrongly says he's in South Carolina, and the other that says his name is Gustavus Vasa and he's free, but it doesn't say anything about where he was born. So what is he as an individual going to do? Is he going to, uh, when he signs on to a ship going to the Arctic, he's going to say, oh, they got my place of birth wrong on one of my documents. He's not ever going to admit that he has anything wrong with his documents because that's, that's, uh, that's what establishes who he is and that he's free. So they're not independent documents. He's not going to con contradict here what's written in his baptismal record. But what we do know about this period, besides the fact that he worked for a lead scientist by the name of Charles Irving, but Charles Irving was extremely close to uh, Constantine Phipps, the head of the expedition, and many other leading scientists and people interested in science, including Sir Joseph Banks. And Sir Joseph Banks was the, the, the president, the first president, the founding president, long-serving president of the very prestigious Royal Society, uh, which was a scientific organization. He was the founder of Kew Gardens in London and collected all the initial specimens uh, for Kew Gardens. And he was one of the ones who was behind the Arctic expedition as well. And uh, it's it just an, another example of the fact that uh, Vasa met and knew and was in the company of very important uh, people in Britain, all of whom considered him to be nothing completely honest completely honest and not the type of person who would lie about something such as where he was born. Moreover, when he was on the um, Arctic expedition, another person who was on that Arctic expedition as a young, young man, as a, as a teenager, very close in age to uh, Gustavus Vasa himself, was uh, Horatio Nelson, uh, the, the ultimate the hero in British history uh, was a member of um, uh, that Arctic expedition and without any question they knew each other. It was impossible not to have known each other since they were all trying to pull the boats, the big boats through the ice. Um, uh, 
Another example that Vasa knew extremely important people, uh, even though he was an African. And one of the reasons that was true was because Vasa was extremely intelligent uh, and worked as a scientist. He was a musician. Uh, he was an excellent writer. Uh, he was heavily involved in politics. And his, his, uh, the man he worked for, Charles Irving, uh, the scientist that he worked for, was um, uh, most famous for his development of an apparatus that could distill seawater. That is, it could turn seawater wa into fresh water, into fresh drinking water. And Vasa was his assistant in the development of this device. Uh, which was used as an, in an experimental basis on the Arctic expedition, on other expeditions of exploration that were um, undertaken in the very early 1770s. And so that uh, Vasa was associated with this development. This, the apparatus uh, for distilling seawater is actually quite simple once you understand what they're doing. It was crucial on board ship at the time uh, in the 18th century to always have a fire going and always having water boiling uh, because you couldn't cook unless you had, uh, a, unless you had a fire uh, and you couldn't keep a fire going because you didn't have matches or, or cigarette lighters or anything like that. So the fire had to be kept going all the time. And what they did is they used coal. Uh, they kept a supply of coal on board ship so they could always have a fire going. And if you have a fire going, it's got to be doing something. And so they were always boiling seawater, uh, big kettles of seawater. And that seawater would create steam. And so this apparatus collected the steam. And when the steam cooled, of course, it had no salt in it. It was fresh water. Well, after the Arctic expedition, um, Vasa went back uh, and continued to work for Dr. Charles Irving. Uh, and his, he, he, Vasa couldn't have known it you know, in a certain kind of way, but Irving was among a, a number of uh, elite British uh, imperialists who were always trying to, th trying to think about you know, new worlds to conquer, how to expand the British Empire. And they, they came up with some pretty crazy ideas, uh, along with ideas that proved to be very successful. Well, Irving was connected with one particularly crazy idea. <clears throat> he was going to uh, open a plantation in what's now Nicaragua in Central America. And he was going to use that plantation as the basis uh, to settle a European colony of planters on the coast of Central America in order to provide provisions and the support that would be necessary for Britain to co conquer all of Latin America. And how they were going to do that was they were going to invade Nicaragua, cross Nicaragua, and cut Latin America in half. And then they were going to encourage the Aztec, the Inca, the Maya, and other subjugated people to the Spanish to stage uprisings in which the British would support. So part of this scheme was Irving was going to go to Central America. And he took our hero, Gustavus Vasa, uh, alias uh, Walada Equiano, they took, he took him as his uh, chief assistant who was going to operate a, a major plantation on the shores of, uh, of uh, the Caribbean in Nicaragua. And they stopped in Jamaica on their way so that Vasa could help uh, Irving buy slaves who were all countrymen, all uh, people that Vasa could understand because they were all Igbo, which is what he did. <clears throat> so at this point, Vasa is not an abolitionist. If anything, he thinks that uh, other people can have a similar experience to him 
uh, as he has had as a slave, become a Christian, buy your own freedom, uh, gain an education, and he wanted to make sure that this would happen in the context of this very crazy scheme, imperial scheme of Irving and others. So they went to the Mosquito Shore, which was what it was called in the, at the time. And incidentally, Mosquito Shore has nothing to do with mosquitoes. It has to do with the Indian term Miskitu, and Miskitu is an ethnic term uh, on this area. It is the name of the people who live there, uh, who actually are not just Indian, but mixed, because there's a lot of African uh, mixture in the population, too. And they went to a place, Rio Grande de Matagalpa. Uh, this is uh, like Rio Grande Matagalpa. And uh, the problem with the terrain there is that it is idyllic. It's beautiful until it rains. And when it rains, it rains so hard that you can't grow anything. So Vasa organized an, a plantation, and they did a really good job until the really heavy rains came and washed and destroyed everything they had done. And it was at that point that Vasa came to realize that you could never reform slavery. The only solution for slavery was to abolish it. And it was at this point that he became an abolitionist. But he came in contact with other unbelievable characters besides Horatio Nelson, Lord Nelson. He also came in contact with Edward Marcus Despard, uh, who, along with Nelson, became involved in this scheme to divide Latin America in half. And both Despard and Horatio Nelson were back in Central America shortly after Vasa left to lead the expedition that proved to be a complete disaster but attempted to conquer all of Nicaragua. Lord Nelson went on to become the national hero. Um, Despard, Colonel Despard, went on to become the symbol of high treason in British history. Uh, the reason being is because when he was on the Mosquito Shore, uh, he fell in love and he married a woman of mixed racial background and became very concerned with racial issues and things like this and therefore actually was involved uh, with his wife in a plot to assassinate King George in 1802. And when that was discovered, of course, he was executed. This is the Haymarket in London, uh, what it looked like at the, about the time that Vasa was there and where Vasa chose to live was in this neighborhood. Vasa's next um, claim to fame was the fact that he was the one who first noticed or heard about the tragedy of the ship, the Zong in which 132 Africans were deliberately murdered in order for the, the ship captain and the owners to collect the insurance uh, on the lost uh, property of slaves that supposedly died in the passage. And it became a court case in London um, between the insurance company and the uh, owners of the ship, because of course the insurance company didn't want to pay the insurance because it was murder. Uh, and this was almost unnoticed in British uh, politics at the time, but Vasa brought it to the, ten the attention of Granville Sharp, the same person that the letter that I referred to above about the name, uh, and it became a major incident in the road to the abolition of the soul. And so that his, his autobiography written in 1789, in which you notice the title, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Wallada Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African. His name is there. He's not using uh, either Gustavus Vasa or Wallada Equiano as a pen name or as a pseudonym. Uh, his name was Gustavus Vasa, and he used the... He referred to his birth name, Wallada Equiano, as one of the bits of proof that demonstrated that he was actually uh, born in Africa. Uh, 
And as I show in my article, there were other evidence too. And the uh, the deciding evidence in many ways is not just the Ichi scarification marks that he describes and many other details, uh, his use of various Igbo phrases and terms uh, that he that are in his book, um, including his own name, his own birth name, uh, but other details too. And the one that I think that is quite conclusive is all of his references in his autobiography, all of his references to circumcision. Uh, at the time in late 18th century Britain, uh, circumcision was considered to be the most barbaric practice anybody in any society could do. And, and British people in particular prided themselves on not circumcising. It's something that Jews did, it's something that Muslims did, it's something that, you know, wild savages in Africa did, but it's not something that British people did. And indeed, it wasn't until the end of the 19th century, a hundred years later, that circumcision was even practiced in hospitals in England for medicinal reasons. That's how opposed to the, to the practice of British society and culture was. Nonetheless, in the book, in his autobiography, he talks about circumcision a lot. He talks about it not in some way as an unfavorable practice. He, he compares his own society with the Jews and with the Muslims, not in a bad way, but one of the reasons he compares them is because of circumcision. He wasn't trying to sell circumcision, and he wasn't trying to use uh, 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 you know, an antipathy to circumcision to sell his book. It was just a matter-of-fact thing that he talked about, and so it's. And he certainly himself uh, was circumcised, and uh, he never would have been circumcised if he had been born on a on a British plantation in South Carolina. Unfortunately, in the recent times, in terms of a celebration of abolition of the slave trade, the people that have been celebrated mostly have been the white abolitionists, Wilberforce and Clarkson, and, and these people. They have not been those who are of African descent, such as Vasa. And it should be noted that the, here, here's, a, here's a picture of, of Queen Charlotte, uh, who was King George II's wife. And Queen Charlotte is who Vasa dedicated his autobiography to. And the reason he did is because Queen Charlotte was known because she known for the fact that she was partly of African descent. Uh, she was known as the Malata Queen because of her she uh, she comes from a family that was Portuguese and she comes from a Portuguese family that without any questions has African background in the family. And so that he dedicated the book to the Queen that he recognized had uh, some affinity because of this African connection. You can see that as later portraits, this is her coronation portrait, the first one, the, the later ones, uh, she becomes whiter and whiter. But again, just to prove his name, when he got married in 1792, uh, his, merit, his marriage certificate says Gustavus Vasa, no reference to anyone by the name of Equiano. His wife was known as Mrs. Vasa, not Mrs. Equiano. His two daughters were known by the name of Vasa. After he published his <clears throat> autobiography, uh, he and his wife, uh, his, his um, Scottish wife, Susanna Cullen, um, they lived with this man and his wife in London, Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy happens to have been, at the time, the most radical uh, person in London. He was the founder of the London Corresponding Society, which was very pro-French Revolution. He was tried for treason. Uh, he was not convicted, but in the course of the ordeal of his trial, his wife died. Um, 
Vasa and his wife lived in the same house as Thomas Hardy. And Vasa was the seventh person to become a member of the London Corresponding Society. He almost certainly knew this man, his name Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, a Frenchman, a black man, uh, the son of a very wealthy Guadeloupe planter and his uh, African concubine. Uh, uh, Le Chevalier went on to become uh, one of the most uh, celebrated uh, fencers uh, in France uh, down to the French Revolution. Uh, he was a composer. He's often referred to as the Black Mozart because his style of, of music is very similar to Mozart. You can go online and you can download any of his concertos. He was a violinist. He was appointed to be the head of the, the, the Paris Opera Company uh, in the 1780s although the leading women opera singers refused to sing under him, and therefore he actually never took up the position. He founded and headed an all-black battalion during the French Revolution that saved Paris from, the, from a Prussian invasion, uh, and he was virtually written out of history by Napoleon. Uh, he died in 1799. Uh, having been having suffered from um, Napoleon's very racist reaction to the French Revolution. He was an acquaintance of uh, Johann Frederick uh, Blumenbach, uh, the founder of, of German anthropology, uh, who, who traveled specifically to London to meet Vasa. Uh, Blumenbach is noted especially for his develop, development of very racist uh, a hierarchy of human development in which he considered blacks at the bottom and whites, of course, at the top. Uh, but he, he used the Vasa as an example that even the people at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, had some people, individuals such as Vasa, who were unbelievably intelligent uh, in showing that the, the range within each um, of the racial categories that he was he was an associate of Robert Wedderburn, another person of African descent. Uh, Robert Wedderburn's father uh, was um, a very wealthy planter who owned um, an, a 19 plantations in Jamaica, in Westmoreland and Hanover parishes. Uh, I've been to the sites of all of those uh, plantations. Uh, Robert himself, uh, his mother was a a slave concubine. His father went back to Scotland and uh, to his real wife and uh, uh, and her children. Uh, they completely had nothing to do with Robert uh, at all. Robert tried to go to Scotland but was not welcome. He ended up being a minister, a preacher in London, a very radical preacher belonging to the same denomination as Gustavus Vasa, uh, the Huntingdonian Methodist uh, connection, and uh, was an astonishing individual in himself. Uh, he preached sermons with the titles uh, such as, this is one, uh, Do Slaves Have a Right to Murder Their Masters? Another one of his sermons was, uh, there is nothing wrong with religion except the clergy. And needless to say, he got himself into a lot of trouble, uh, but he's one of Vasa's associates. His half-sister is our Lady Selkirk of the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, she she and Robert, of course, had nothing to do with each other, um, but it does show a Canadian connection besides the wolf connection that I've already talked about uh, between Vasa uh, and the world of the time. So this was Gustavus Vasa. Uh,
This is a man who was Igbo in origin, who discovered his Igbo-ness and discovered his Africanness in diaspora and fought his whole life uh, to advance uh, the, the position of people from Africa.